pardon the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre. I am in Miami, where it has been so hot and so sticky. Tony Kornheiser, you know, meteorologists call that the levitard effect. It's as if you are standing under a <laughs> fountain and just you're just dripping wet all yes. the time. Yes, yes. It's a panoramic humidity. It gets into your bones. It gets into your bank account, it turns out. But it smudges everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it does. It, yes, it does. It's like those worms that you can chop up, but they don't actually die and they regenerate and That's exactly they get right. all over you. That's yep. the Levitard effect. Worms Welcome to PTI, everywhere. boys and girls. Wilbon apparently doesn't love you like I do. So coming in out of our pen is our great friend with a limited marketing budget, Mr. Pablo Torre. Color now. Ooh, color. Good cheers, good cheers. And we begin today with the Angels' decision on Shohei Otani. Sports Illustrated reported the Angels will not move Otani before the trade deadline on August 1st. Indeed, the Angels are going for the playoffs as buyers. Last night, they traded two top prospects to the White Sox for L.A. born and raised starting pitcher Lucas Giolito and right-handed reliever Ronaldo Lopez. And today, they watched as Otani threw a complete game, one hit, shutout, beating the Tigers. Pablo, how big of a risk are the Angels taking by going for it? This feels like risk aversion, Tony. And yes, it has helped when the guy you decide to keep has eight strikeouts and only gives up one <laughs> hit in the shutout that you just mentioned. Helpful when your employee decides to back you like that. But for me, there is the risk of, OK, if we are to trade him, we're basically saying we don't want Shohei Otani anymore. We're out of the Shohei Otani business. So from a, just a macroeconomic perspective, that's the business you want to be in. It's the business you want to be in because the guy can do what he did today. It's the business you want to be in because now you are three and a half games back of the wild card after being, what, eight years out of the postseason altogether? You're all in on this season, and they should be. Yeah, I will say this. I don't think this is any risk at all. I think this is the only sane decision that they can make. <laughs> they have in their hands right now Shohei Otani, who is the most valuable baseball player in the world. Now, maybe they can't keep him. Maybe he wants to walk, and nothing they can do probably, can stop him from walking. Probably will walk. But in the interim, if they think to themselves, maybe if we make the playoffs, he will listen to us, then you do everything you can to get into the playoffs. Because doing anything else is embarrassing, and it is the admission of failure. I agree with this completely. Respect winning. Try and get to where you can win, just like today. Ride him if you can. Because he dropped into your lap a few years ago, you, you just don't want to lose him, right? You don't want to. No, and I'll also offer a less noble incentive here, which is just the sheer cowardice of not wanting to be the guy who had to orchestrate a trade for some yeah. stuff that's not going to be equal value at this point, Tony. It's the Babe Ruth curse, the curse of the Bambino. But on top of that, it's also the realization that what are you going to get back that's going to make anybody satisfied? You're giving up on the postseason. Well, this is an important You're concept. You're giving up on Otani, too. Yes. This is the important concept. People say don't trade top prospects. But I don't buy that. What is the math on top prospects that become terrific players? Is it 40%? Is it 60%? Is it 20%? I, I think it's overrating prospects. And I'll give you an example. Lucas Giolito was one mm -hmm. of the great prospects of all time when the Washington Nationals got him. His record as a Chicago White Sox starter, 59 and 52 with an ERA of 4.20. It's okay, but it's not particularly good. They traded him for Adam Eaton. And when Adam Eaton was an everyday player, the Washington Nationals won a World Series ring. So how much do they miss Lucas Giolito even now? Not at all is the correct answer. No, and now he's helpful, hopefully, to Shohei Otani. But I want to move on, Tony. Yeah. I want to move on to reports that Colorado is making moves. They're ready to jump back to the Big 12 in 2024. And Colorado, you may recall this, you know, they've been terrible in the Pac-12. But Deion Sanders is their coach now. He's arrived. The profile, the possibilities are all pointing upwards. And so the Big 12's presidents and chancellors unanimously accepted the Buffaloes last night. So what does this move do for the Big 12? Where does it leave the Pac-12? So when I heard about this story today, this morning, I was really excited because I thought it meant that Colorado would play Oklahoma in football this year and Deion Sanders would get a chance to stick it to Brent Venables, who had been so mm. holier than thou about Deion. 
And then I found out it's not going to happen. Colorado, if they move, wouldn't get there till next year, 2024. And at that point, Oklahoma would have moved to the SEC. So I was hoping the story would be that Colorado is moving to the SEC just so Dion could get that chance. <laughs> what does it mean for the Big 12? I honestly don't think it means much because Colorado stinks at the moment. And they were in the Big 8. I mean, they're just sort of coming home. What does it say about the Pac-12? It, it, it just illustrates what Larry Scott has done to them or had done to them as commissioner. Take this great conference and make it into a giant yawing sinkhole, okay? <laughs> they have lost their cornerstone Southern California franchises, UCLA and USC. They now lose Colorado. Everybody says that Berkeley and Stanford are looking for some place to go. So at the moment, the Pac-12 seems like it's all been gathered into one of those pods and it's ready to be hauled off somewhere. Yes, what it tells me, Tony, in so many words is that there is no aphrodisiac quite like desperation. Colorado <laughs> is bad. They're bad, I'll give you the record, right? Since they joined the Pac-12, 27 and 76. Okay, but because the Big 12 needs something, suddenly Colorado, a Power 5 edition, a Power 5 edition in big brand trademark letters, they're helpful to the Big 12. And meanwhile, the Pac-12, you're absolutely right. They're a conference in which administrators have been begging, waiting, asking George Klyovkov, their Larry Scott replacement, where's our media deal? The whole business we're in is television, and they yeah. don't have one. They've been told to be patient. Klyovkov has said, we're not worried about the Big 12, and now the big domino effect mm -hmm. might just be the Colorado leaves and Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, the Four Corners schools, right. yeah. they, they yeah. might follow. Yeah, the problem, though, is the Big 12 is like inching up on 27 teams as we speak, <laughs> and none of them are glamour teams. They're not. No. They're not glamorous football teams. When Texas and Oklahoma leave, they, they just have great geographic distribution, but they don't have anybody that around the country people want to see. We move now, I love this story, to Sean Payton. The new coach of the Denver Broncos unloading mm. on the old coach of the Denver Broncos, Nathaniel Hackett. Peyton told USA Today that Hackett's 15-game tenure at Denver last year, and I'm quoting here, might have been one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. Continuing the quote, it doesn't happen often where an NFL team or organization gets embarrassed, and that happened here, end quote. Pablo, I can understand why Peyton wants people to believe that Russell Wilson was not to blame for last year, but this feels like a bomb going off. What do you make of this? Yeah, Sean Payton, we know, likes to get messy. And it's fun in sports, in life, when someone's desire to make a mess in terms of getting some tea spilled, some gossip started, when it doubles as a chess move. Because helping Russell Wilson, that's the chess move here by drawing all the attention towards Nathaniel Hackett. But my lord, Tony, look at the quotes in this story. They said, I mean, in USA Today, Sean Payton told them they couldn't get a play in last season. They basically... There, Sean Payton is quoted as saying that the coaching staff was soft. He said that the private quarterback coach that Russell Wilson brought in was not Russell Wilson's fault. It was the fault of the quote-unquote parents who let it happen. These are not just shots across the bow to Daniel Hackett. These are laser-trained sniper bullets, and they found their target. Yeah. So remember about a minute and a half ago I told you how disappointed I was that Oklahoma would not be playing Colorado this year. Well, I'm over that now because, <laughs> and I want to get this correct, at 4.25 p.m. on Sunday, October 8th, I'm going to get to see the Denver Broncos at home host the New York Jets with their new oh. offensive coordinator, wait for it, Nathaniel Hackett. And Peyton yes. didn't just take out after Hackett. He crushed the Jets as well because Robert Sala had to answer all of these things today. I mean, he said that the Jets shouldn't be on hard knocks, and he basically criticized the Jets for celebrating themselves for getting Aaron Rodgers. So if it turns out that the Jets beat the Broncos, Sean Payton's going to look really stupid on this one. I know him a little bit. I like him. I think he's a really fine coach. The Saints were one of the worst teams, worst franchises ever until he got there, and he won a Super Bowl there. But, Pablo, I thought there was some sort of code that coaches don't go after other coaches. Right. Right. Quite like this. I mean, if Hackett reads this this morning, he's got to go, oh, my God, I sort of find myself rooting for Hackett now. 
Well, that's the thing, Tony. This is a risk-seeking move by Sean Payton because more than protecting Russell Wilson, what this does is put a target now on him if, in fact, they lose in week one. The bar, Tony, the bar for Sean Payton was so low. It was subterranean. It was the Nathaniel Hackett bar. And what Sean Payton decided to do was point down at the bar and laugh at it <laughs> instead of take it for what it was, which is a gift. Yeah. Yeah, because if Russell Wilson at 34 turns out to be Matt Ryan, then what? Let's take a, a break. Bet. Coming up, what does Aaron Rodgers' reworked contract mean for the Jets? And should Team USA be encouraged or discouraged after tying the Netherlands last night? Those are bomb quotes. I mean, they really are. What like, a this dream. is a guy in the club. What? Yes. The tape recorder is yeah. running, and Sean Payton is doing his greatest rendition of Sinatra. It's a my way, a little uh, bit of my just, way here. Yeah. Smells like mail time. Let's take a whiff of the first Mail time? If we could. That's what that was. What does Aaron Rodgers' reworked deal signal to you? Tony, he gave up $33 million guaranteed. What it signals is that he's trying to be everything that the Packers did not get, what the Packers longed for. He's getting jewelry from his teammates. He's taking them to Broadway plays. He is giving back the money that he, that he left over. Tony, he is giving them the greatest gift an athlete can give their employer because in this sport especially, $33 million guaranteed is not symbolic. That is actual dough that they will use to get better. It is the greatest gift imaginable. Yeah, so I think Aaron Rodgers has done everything right since he got to New York. I think he is winning by a lot, the public relations battle. I think it's easy to do that in July, but I give him credit for winning and knowing exactly how to behave. I have to tell you, I find it hard to believe he's actually giving up what I thought was $35 million, but if it's $33 million, that's okay. I find it hard to believe he's actually giving that up. I mean, because he's 39 years old, he doesn't have that many years left to make it back. But I'll take it at face value. I'll say that he probably thinks he could be like Tom Brady and play well into his 40s. What it says to me is that he goes to the Jets and he gives them a shopping list and he says, look, I've given yep. up this money, and this is what I want you to acquire for this money. As Bill Parcells would call it, the groceries. That's what he wants, right? Well, that's what Tom... Look, Tom Brady gave up the money, didn't necessarily get to go shopping. I think Aaron Rodgers is asking for that exact treatment. But I just want to point out, yeah. this is the advantage. This is the biggest advantage in a salary cap sport, that we do not expect star quarterbacks to sacrifice but it's the only way you can begin to hack into that system. Nathaniel Hackett, pun, maybe possibly intended, because they're going to need the help. Because you know, Tony, you know. You're right. It's the offseason. Yes, he's won the press conference. But yep. let week yep. one come yep. and let it go that other way. And then it's, guess what? You're going to have to pay a lot more in other ways. You know, it's, it's, it's Brady envy to a large degree. <laughs> and it's probably the right thing to do for Rodgers. Probably, Next yeah. letter. Don't Next. blame him. Should the U.S. women's national team feel encouraged or discouraged by its tie with the Netherlands? I think it's discouraging. It's discouraging because, because the U.S. women's national team has depth that is unparalleled on this planet. Their second unit, so to speak, is one of the best teams in the world. And their manager only made one substitution that resulted in the popular consensus among soccer experts far brighter than I that resulted in a 1-1 draw with a team that is lesser than. So to me, you have all the talent, but you don't have the manager, Tony. And that is a discouraging thing, given that you have the hardest thing you're supposed to have. Yeah, I was looking for a third choice here because I didn't really feel encouraged or discouraged. I mean, you know, when you tie another team on a neutral site, I mean, a part of me says, why did you even play the game? I think both teams will probably win their next game. I think both teams will probably advance. If I'm put to the wall on this, I would say encouraged mildly 
because they were down one nothing and they yes. got the last goal of the game. And it and the athlete Ashley who gave Duran. us the goal was almost in a fist fight about five <laughs> minutes before with somebody who turns out to be her normal teammate, and she puts it in with her head. And that's so much fun to watch. That's the coolest thing in soccer to me, you know, when, when it goes off your head. But I have yeah, mildly encouraged. I'm impressed that you know a lot more about soccer than I do. Well, everybody does. I, I just everybody like does. that we have established that Tony Kornheiser, unsurprisingly, a fan of the headbutt, a fan of brute that's force, right. not subtlety in this I think game. It's good. No. I think it's good. Enough email. Let's take one last break still to come. Could Michigan and Ohio State get moved earlier in the calendar? And the Yankees, my Yankees, Tony, they prepare to welcome back one Aaron Judge. Yeah. They don't hit without Aaron Judge at all, do they? They don't no. hit. No. I mean. Makes me want to headbutt how, the entirety of that roster, to be honest. How can Aaron Judge be that important that nobody else? Tonight on Sports Center at 6 Eastern. Why is Sean Payton calling last Bronco season the worst coaching job in NFL history? Plus, Ryan Clark on the expectations for Dak Prescott and the Cowboys this season. And what Dion in Colorado's move to the Big 12 means for college football. Sports Center, 6 Eastern on ESPN. Happy time, people. Happy 39th birthday, Max Scherzer, the warrior god, my favorite player. Scherzer <laughs> and Justin Verlander, who are both headed to the Hall of Fame, are reunited this year on the Mets. They haven't had the dominant years management hoped for. Scherzer's 8-4, and four, but his ERA is 4.20, his highest since 2011, when he and Verlander were on the Tigers. Scherzer has three Cy Youngs, two no-hitters. He's the active leader in strikeouts just ahead of Verlander. He's 12th all-time. And he has a World Series ring with the Washington Nationals. Scherzer will pitch against the Nationals tomorrow night. Then wait to see if the Mets are buyers or sellers at Tuesday's trade deadline. Both he and Verlander have no trade clauses and would have to agree if the Mets sought to move him. And the Mets should try to, Tony, they have to try to move your favorite player. I know he is your why you're God, but Steve Cohen, the owner of the Mets, has more money than God himself, which means that you can sell Max Scherzer pending that trade approval Eat some of the salary, get prospects back. The Mets need this. The Mets are 17 and a half games back. I cannot stress this enough. You have to move Max Scherzer. I'm not responding to this nonsense. <laughs> Happy anniversary, Jose Guillen. On this day 25 years ago, the Pirates' right fielder uncorked an absolute guided missile of a throw. From just inside the warning track to rob the Rockies batter, Nafi Perez of a triple. Right to third is the hardest throw in baseball. Ichiro made an iconic throw like this. Vlad Guerrero had a legendary arm. The Pirates had two of the greatest right field arms ever, Roberto Clemente's and Dave Parker's. This one is worth praising because of the accuracy and velocity on the fly the whole way. Guillen, who was named in the Mitchell Report, also played with Tampa Bay, Arizona, Cincinnati, Oakland, the Angels, Nats, Rangers, Royals, and Giants in a career that lasted through 2010. But it is... It's the feud with Mike Socha, his former manager with the Angels, Tony, that I remember most vividly because Jose Guillen said this, quote, Mike Socha to me is like a piece of garbage, period. He can go to hell, period. So, yeah. pretty well, good Well, at quote. least he didn't have a strong opinion on Socha or anything like that. Happy trails, <laughs> Noah Syndergaard. The once mighty Thor has been traded from the Dodgers to Cleveland for shortstop Ahmed Rosario. Syndergaard, who has been rehabbing a blister on his right index finger in the minors, was 1-4 with a terrible 7.16 ERA over 12 starts for the Dodgers and has noticeably lost velocity. Cleveland will be his fourth stop in the past two years, including the Angels and Phillies. Think back to how promising the Mets rotation seemed seven and eight years ago. Syndergaard has become an itinerant. Matt Harvey retired after chronic arm trouble and a suspension for drug distribution. Steven Matz is 1-7 with a 4-3-4 ERA in St. Louis. And Jacob deGrom is wealthy in Texas, but has now undergone a second Tommy John surgery. 
Is there a more cursed positional grouping than starting pitchers for the New York Mets? Tony, Generation K, Isringhausen, Pulsifer, Paul Wilson, that was once the standard. But the group you just mentioned, clearly in that ignominious tradition. Really bad. I mean, just, you know, they, went, they, all, they all went down the drain. Two omissions. First, Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow went down at practice with a non-contact calf injury. The severity is as yet unknown. If it is severe, that's mm. bad for the Bengals. Yes. Also, we talked about Shohei throwing a complete game one hitter in game one of a doubleheader against the Tigers. Just as a passing fact, in game two, he hit his 37th home run, Pablo. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Let's go to the big finish, if we could. Bronny James, after suffering cardiac arrest Monday, has been discharged from the hospital. He is at home resting your thoughts. Credit goes to the USC medical staff, Tony. That's what the hospital credited for saving his life. Jalen Ramsey left Dolphins practice with a knee injury. Is that significant? Yeah, the defensive backs have to be quick. They need both knees. That's how it works. Newsday says Ben Simmons, your boy, 100% healthy. Is that significant? As the world's lone remaining all-in stockholder, absolutely. Ohio State coach Ryan Day is open to moving the Michigan game earlier. Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't make any sense to me. They play in the last game of the regular season. And then, if they're in the Big Ten championship, they play in the next game. Playing back-to-back -back is what people want to see. This is Ohio State and Michigan. This isn't Rutgers and Maryland. Stop it. Last one. Your boy Aaron Judge could return tomorrow for the Yankees. You must be excited. I am excited because it is all I have left to feel about this Yankees season. Yes, bring back the guy really? who was not enough to save us, even though he's the only one who can save us. All you have left. What an existential dilemma. We're out of time. We'll try to do better the next time, and I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Thank you for watching my existential dilemma. www.pablo.show is where you can find more of that dilemma. But for now, your sports center. That looks so terrible, honestly. You need a professional Come to do on, that. There's just, color now. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look, have you enjoyed Miami, by the way? Are you happy it's there? It's just a little sweaty. Mm.